I'm going to start with uh, the end and then show you the data that supports the overall scheme. And that is uh, what I'm going to try and convince you is that intestinal microbes play a contributory role to the development of cardiovascular disease. Uh, what our group has found is that we're diets that were familiar or food sources that were familiar with increased risk of cardiovascular disease, such as those abundant in fat and cholesterol, and illustrated on the left there, are also associated with increased levels of trimethylamine-containing nutrients, such as phosphatidylcholine or choline, uh, shown in the bottom left, and also carnitine, shown uh, on the, in the mid-left. And what I'm going to show you is that gut flora contain enzymes that will actually cleave the trimethylamine moiety off of the uh, nutrient generating TMA or trimethylamine. This is a gas at body temperatures. We have within our livers a cluster of enzymes called flavin monooxygenases, which are capable of then uh, very efficiently oxidizing TMA into what we uh, are the field used to think of as purely a nitrogenous waste product, TMAO, or trimethylamine and oxide. But what I hope to show you is that this actual compound has biological activity and can actually alter cholesterol and sterile metabolism at multiple different compartments. And not only is it associated with cardiovascular disease outcomes in humans, but in animal models will actually facilitate or accelerate the development of atherosclerosis, suggesting that gut flora through this axis can actually perturb, or uh, perturb the development of cardiovascular disease. Oh. So there are also a couple other take-home messages that I'd like to try and discuss today. And that is the first is that um, if you think about things coming from either genetics or environment, how we perceive that our environment is, is influenced through the filters that are there. And our largest environmental exposure is what we eat. We literally consume kilogram quantities of foreign material, if you think of food as a foreign object. And it is through this filter of the intestinal microbiome. And if you have different compositions and you're making slightly different metabolites at different levels from one person to another, uh, the, the filters can actually influence phenotype in that way. The second thing that I'd like to also suggest is that we should think of the intestinal microbiome as an endocrine organ. An endocrine organ is, of course, something that makes a hormone. And if a hormone, by definition, is a biologically active compound that will diffuse in the circulation and act at a distant site, I'm going to give you examples of how compounds are being generated in the intestines and diffusing and then acting at the site of, let's say, a macrophage in the artery wall or a hepatocyte in the liver or an enterocyte in the intestine and influencing the biology. Uh, so it's a quite plastic organ, to be sure, and it changes depending upon what the chronic dietary exposure is and what the acute uh, dietary intake is, but nonetheless, it's functioning like an endocrine organ. And then lastly, while I'm not going to show you data on this, I think what um, is exciting about this whole, ass, uh, this whole field is that this is a druggable target. If we start to understand the chemical braille of the different pathways of what the microbes are generating and how they're biologically active, then these become targets for pharmacologic intervention through inhibitors or agonists. Not an antibiotic, but an inhibitor. And so perhaps in our future, we'll look at our medicine cabinet and see, let's say, a statin and say, oh, that's our homo sapien enzyme inhibitor for blocking cholesterol synthesis. And right next to it will be a tablet for blocking a specific enzyme in bacteria that doesn't kill it, but actually prevents the formation of compounds that might be linked to cardiometabolic diseases or obesity or whatever, or maybe even our behavior, as we just recently heard. OK, so how did we actually get into this? I am not a microbiologist. And I am not actually, my history has not been working on a microbiome. Instead, we're, I'm actually a chemist and, and run the mass spectrometry facility at my institution. And we started with an unbiased metabolomic screening study. We were using a, a cohort uh, for which I'm the PI. It's called GeneBank, has over 10,000 subjects for whom we've collected their blood and then followed longitudinally over time. And so from this cohort, we identified a small subset who went on and experienced heart attack, stroke, and death, 
and age and gender matched control subjects. And then within each person's plasma in this small case control cohort, we asked, can we find small molecules that are associated with cardiovascular disease risk? So we did this in a learning set, and we did it in a validation cohort. In the end, we came up with a small subset of compounds which actually seem to reproducibly associate with cardiovascular disease. Well, the surprising finding was is that some of these compounds fell into a common pathway, and that was involved in phosphatidylcholine metabolism. Now, what uh, the three main candidates in our first paper were uh, choline, uh, betaine, which is, a carbo is the oxidation product of choline, and then this small molecule that I call TMAO, or trimethylamine and oxide, which is shown in the structures at the bottom. And so what this association study suggested is that there at least was an association between multiple metabolites in phosphatidylcholine metabolism and cardiovascular disease risk. So we first wanted to actually look at mechanistic studies to see was there a causal link. So, oh, I'm sorry. I'm switching the order of my slides here. Um, so the first thing we actually wanted to also uh, confirm was um, if, if one looks at phosphatidylcholine metabolism, the classic pathway that we're, how all of us digest phosphatidylcholine is we have lipases that cleave off the fatty acids, and then glycerophosphocholine and the fatty acids are absorbed in our intestines. However, there was a suggestion that TMA and TMAO might be ultimately generated via gut microbes because certain bacteria could cleave choline in forming TMA. But this really hadn't been shown, especially for phosphatidylcholine, to involve uh, intestinal microbes. So we uh, received germ-free animals from Taconic and then did the experiment where we took the germ-free animals and immediately upon opening the microisolators, gavaged them with isotope labeled phosphatidylcholine or uh, egg yolk phosphatidylcholine and then monitored in the plasma the appearance of the different isotopologs of the metabolites of phosphatidylcholine such as choline, betaine, and TMAO. And as can be seen on the left, what was found is that in the germ-free animals following uh, ingestion of phosphatidylcholine, no TMAO was generated or appeared in the plasma over time. But in contrast, if you took the same germ-free animals, and now we put them in conventional cages, and two weeks later, they've now uh, assumed intestinal microbial communities, they've become conventionalized, and now when we gavage them with phosphatidylcholine, TMAO rapidly appeared in the plasma following ingestion of the phosphatidylcholine, showing that TMAO was indeed formed in an obligatory way, or it required the role of gut flora to be generated, or gut microbiota. Now, you've seen this uh, slide uh, shown, uh, I guess, throughout this uh, just earlier today, um, but more recently, uh, Wilson Tang and our group kind of tried to extend these studies to humans. And what we looked at were uh, using egg yolk, or two hard-boiled eggs, as the dietary source of phosphatidylcholine in subjects. And at baseline, we would give them the hard-boiled eggs and then monitor for the appearance of this metabolite, TMEO, in the plasma and in the urine. We also gave them a capsule of synthetic isotope labeled phosphatidylcholine where the N-methyl hydrogens were now deuteron, so we could trace the, um, and so for certain that the metabolite that we were measuring, TMEO, came from phosphatidylcholine, because there's many things inside of a hard-boiled egg besides phosphatidylcholine. And what we were able to show is that at baseline, you could readily detect TMEO. This is six hours following ingestion of two hard-boiled eggs. If then the, these are healthy volunteers, were placed on a cocktail of oral antibiotics and then came back five or six days later and repeated the challenge, the formation of the TMEO was virtually completely eliminated. And so none was detected in both the plasma and in the urine. And then after cessation of the antibiotics and going home and coming back a month later, repeated the challenge, and now you see it again. So this showed an obligatory role for intestinal microbes in the formation of this metabolite that we're measuring in the blood. Now, why do we think that's important? Um, so first of all, if we actually measured the metabolite in the plasma of subjects, we saw that it was strikingly associated with cardiovascular risk. What is shown here is an independent study of over 1,800 subjects where we have the baseline plasma level and we're looking at cardiovascular disease. This is 
the risk is shown on the y-axis, the odds of having cardiovascular disease after adjustment for traditional risk factors, uh, such as those in the Framingham risk factor or formula, age, gender, diabetes, hypertension, smoking, LDL, HDL, and also has the addition of um, other labs that are currently used for evaluating cardiac risk, such as triglyceride and CRP, and an estimate of renal function. And if you focus your attention on the center graph, what you can see is that there's a, a striking distribution or association between the plasma level of TMAO and the likelihood of risk of having cardiovascular disease in subjects. So the, the line in the middle is the odds ratio and the dotted lines are the 95% confidence interval. And there's quite a steep association. And if one were to look at LDL cholesterol, for example, it would be a much more horizontal line uh, in this cohort. So this is still just associative data but nonetheless, it's compelling because that was independent and above on top of traditional risk factors. More recently, we've extended this to an alternative independent cohort for whom we followed over time who went on to develop heart attack, stroke, or death. And what we see is that um, baseline levels are predicting future risks of myocardial infarction, stroke, and death. If one looks at the composite of this, of major adverse cardiac events, that's in the bottom left-hand corner, the fourth quartile, so the top 1,000 subjects compared to the bottom 1,000, the first quartile is the index group for comparison, they have about a fourfold increased likelihood of experiencing an event in the next three-year period. And the line represents the 95% confidence interval. And shown on the right are kaplan meier survival plot showing that your plasma TMAO level is a good independent predictor of prospective uh, survival. So to take this into a more mechanistic realm, we started doing animal model studies. And at first we actually fed mice phosphatidylcholine and actually saw that they got accelerated atherosclerosis, but they also gained more weight, they were getting more calories, and there was the whole issue of the fatty acid composition, maybe that was contributing to the disease. So we instead started just giving choline in the diet. Now choline for animals, for mammals, has no uh, calories. Um, we don't catabolize choline and generate calories from it. Um, and we also don't see changes in either the cholesterol or the lipoprotein or glucose or insulin levels in the animals that are on the choline diet. But nonetheless, what we found is that augmenting an atherosclerosis-prone animal's diet with choline led to accelerated atherosclerosis. So shown in the open bars were the wild-type conventionalized animals on a um, normal child diet on the control side, and the choline represents a high-choline diet, which is approximately what would be a very high-fat Western diet in terms of its choline content. Uh, shown in the black bars are animals in which the intestinal microbial uh, community was suppressed by a cocktail of broad-spectrum antibiotics. The TMAO levels in plasma, which are shown below in red, were suppressed to near zero levels throughout the course of the study, which is about a 20-week duration. And what was seen is that the increase in atherosclerotic plaque, here measured by um, macrophage, uh, the major cell type in the, in, the macrophage, in the aorta, but also this is done, has been done by cholesterol content or oil red O staining, that the diet-induced atherosclerosis was inhibited in the animals in which the gut flora was suppressed and TMEO was not generated. Now, importantly, what was also found, um, I'm sorry, I don't have it here. What was also found is that if we fed TMAO directly to the animals and bypassed the microbes, that alone was sufficient to increase and augment accelerated atherosclerosis in the mouse model. Now, in working out the mechanism, we started looking at a variety of different places. And if what was found is that the macrophage was accumulating cholesterol, um, so we focused on cholesterol metabolism. And so if one thinks of uh, the macrophage kind of shown in that ugly cell on the right in purple um, as a black box, and you say it's accumulating cholesterol, you can either have enhanced pathways for De delivering cholesterol into the cell, more cholesterol being synthesized in the cell, or decreased removal of cholesterol from the cell. You know, increased flux in, decreased flux out, or more synthesis in the cell. And so we kind of looked at it in this simplified black box approach and looked at candidates involved in cholesterol metabolism uh, to try to work out the details of how was cholesterol accumulating in cells of the artery wall. 
it turned out to be a little bit of a complex mechanism. And we still don't know precisely all of the pathways that are involved. But what was found was that there was both enhanced forward cholesterol transport, and in particular on the macrophage, there was upregulation of genes involved in uh, recognition of modified forms of LDL, such as scavenger receptor SRA1 and CD36. These were effects of directly of TMAO when fed to animals, as well as when cultured with, uh, when incubated with cultured macrophages. What was also observed is that there were changes in cholesterol and bile acid metabolism at the level of the hepatocyte and also the enterocyte. So there's a substantial reduction in bile acid pool size and composition, changes in the bile acid transport pathways, uh, such as CYPS27A and CYPS7A1, and then also changes in enterocyte cholesterol and bile acid transporters as well. The net effect is shown on the top right-hand corner. There is enhanced forward cholesterol transport, and if one actually directly measured the reverse cholesterol transport pathway using methods that were first developed by Dan Rader and colleagues at University of Pennsylvania, we saw that there was actually about a 30% reduction in reverse cholesterol transport that was mediated by either TMEO directly in animals that were fed the TMEO or in animals that were fed the precursor choline when they had intact flora. But if you suppressed the flora and blocked the TMEO formation, you no longer saw the changes in cholesterol and sterol metabolism or in bile acid synthesis that was being observed. Now, I so far kind of showed you data that was mostly done with choline, but more recently we've actually started expanding these studies to alternative dietary nutrients that are um, similarly uh, trimethylamine containing, and so uh, like carnitine was the one we were focusing on. Now, the reason why we focused on carnitine is because there's substantial epidemiologic data that argues that red meat is associated with increased cardiovascular risks. And in particular, for example, this recent uh, study that came out by the Harvard Nutrition Group looking at both the health profession follow-up study and the nurse's health study combined, they have over almost 3 million follow-up years of information with almost 24,000 deaths, uh, followed with an average follow-up period of over 20 years. And what was seen is that for each one portion increase per day, in red meat amongst the individuals that were followed in this, these, these studies, it accounts for somewhere between a 13 to a 20% increase in mortality over the course of the duration of follow-up, which is, as I said, either a 20 or 28 year period, depending on the two different studies. And, and by the way, a portion size by the nutritionists, uh, it always strikes me as a little bit uh, funny that they're so small. It's only three ounces is considered one portion of red meat. I don't know about you, but that seems to me like the snack that you eat before you have dinner, as opposed to the real portion size. Um, so why the interest in red meat? Well, carnitine is a nutrient that's almost exclusively found in red meat, certainly in meat. Um, and the structure is shown here, and it has that same trimethylamine moiety on it. And um, it, it actually derives its name from the Latin root word where carnivore comes from, meaning flesh. And that's because the chemists who first discovered carnitine structure over a century ago found that the, the food su substances that it was in were essentially of flesh. And red meat in particular has high level. And if you're wondering what red meat has the highest level, kangaroo by the way, has 50-fold higher level carnitine than beef. So don't go out and eat kangaroo patties um, if you want to try and cut down on your carnitine ingestion. But anyway, carnitine uh, plays a role normally in fatty acid transport into mitochondria. Um, we make all the carnitine we eat from our diet. It's not an essential amino acid. Um, it is made by lysine after, and lysine being the single most abundant amino acid in both plant and animal proteins. Uh, most individuals, unless you have a genetic defect, um, do not have carnitine deficiency, or it's a very rare phenotype. So we were interested in the same kind of story. Could carnitine generate TMEO and accelerate atherosclerosis? Just to speed up, because I want to leave time for questions, we use the germ-free animals and we're able to show that when you ingest or when animals ingest uh, carnitine, uh, they, uh, and they're germ-free, they do not make TMEO, but when they're conventionalized, they do. 
We then wanted to translate this to human clinical studies. Bob Koth, a postdoc, or I'm sorry, he was an MSTP in my lab. This was his thesis research, the carnitine story. He did the study where actually we generated, um, we used uh, a, a, literally a, uh, a grill uh, that had that on the box cover and, um, and used uh, steak as our source of uh, natural source of carnitine, isotope labeled carnitine in a pill and did the same kind of experiment where at visit one they'd get a carnitine challenge and over time measure the appearance and disappearance of the metabolites, go on antibiotics, suppress the intestinal flora, et cetera. So doing that same kind of experiment as we did with the phosphatidylcholine, what we saw is that while they had in individuals have intact flora, they readily generate TMAO from ingestion of carnitine, but following suppression of the intestinal flora, uh, no TMEO is generated by ingesting carnitine, suggesting that carnitine formation of TMEO has an obligatory requirement uh, for gut flora as well. So taking this to atherosclerosis animal models, we used the APOE null mouse model. What we saw is there was about a two-fold increase in aortic root atherosclerosis in animals that were on a carnitine diet, despite no changes in their cholesterol levels, their weights or triglyceride levels. Um, if you suppress the intestinal flora, and bring the TMA and TMAO levels down to near zero over the course of the duration of the study, we saw, on looking at the right-hand panel, no diet-dependent increase in atherosclerosis. Now, one of the intriguing findings that we saw during the course of these studies was that the animals that were on the chronic carnitine diet showed a tenfold increase in their synthetic capacity to make TMAO compared to normal chow mice. This suggested that the chronic dietary exposure to carnitine had actually shifted the intestinal microbial composition to such that the microbes were now those that, those that preferred carnitine as a substrate had become, had a selective advantage and had grown more, and now carnitine-dependent conversion into TMA and TMAO was occurring more readily because of the shift in intestinal microbes. And actually through looking at the 16S ribosomal DNA of the feces or, and also of the the sequel contents, we saw that this had actually, in fact, happened. Uh, in studies that we actually performed in collaboration with our UPenn colleagues, such as Rick Bushman and Gary Wu, who are here, we actually looked at omnivores versus vegetarian and vegans as well to see if this naturally occurring diversity in carnitine ingestion, that is, vegetarian and vegans have a very low carnitine ingestion rate compared to omnivores, could we see a microbial shift, if you will, in the formation of TMA production in the subjects. And this is data just from one omnivore who was characteristic or exemplary, um, and one vegan who is an intrepid vegan who agreed to eat a steak, as well as take the capsule with the methylated, carn uh, the deuterated carnitine. And what was seen is that following ingestion of carnitine, the vegan had an exceedingly low synthetic capacity to make TMAO. Uh, compared to the omnivore. And this was true with both the natural abundance as well as the uh, isotope labeled precursor carnitine. Um, what's shown here are data with larger numbers um, that when we compared a larger number of vegetarians to omnivores, that the omnivores had a higher level of TMAO in general. And then shown on the right are for those who went through the full isotope labeled carnitine challenge, there is a very dramatic difference in TMAO synthetic capacity or production rate uh, following ingestion of carnitine seen in the vegans compared to the omnivores. The vegans, as was seen with the, the other vegan who ate only uh, the steak and capsule, those who just had the capsule were very, very poor at generating TMAO. Now, when doing the microbial composition analysis of the, uh, from feces analysis, uh, what was seen is that there were multiple different taxonomic groupings of microbes that associated not only with the dietary pattern, but also with the plasma TMAO level. And shown in the red box here is an example of two different patterns. Um, uh, the top one is illustrated as a lower proportion in vegetarian and vegans, this particular taxa, uh, and associated with lower TMAO level. And in contrast, for example, in the Lachnospira, that's a proportion of a, a specific genus that's higher in the vegetarian and vegan and associated with lower TMAO. And so uh, the chronic dietary pattern had actually shifted the intestinal microbial composition of the subjects, and this was associated with the altered TMAO level. 
Now to bring this back to humans and cardiovascular disease, which is my main research interest, we wanted to know how could we do this. And it turns out that there have been many studies that suggest that individuals who eat more carnitine have higher plasma levels of carnitine. And so we actually then went ahead and measured carnitine in over 2,500 subjects and asked, does it track with cardiac risks? And the answer was it did actually quite well if you adjusted for traditional risk factors, it worked as good or better as LDL cholesterol or blood sugar or any of the current diagnostic tests that we use for and are associated with cardiac risk. Carnitine was uh, independent and better, if you will. But what we also found is that in individuals, um, if you then stratified by their TMAO level, only those subjects who had a concurrent high TMAO level, where this is above and below the median analysis, so you needed to have a high carnitine and a high TMAO level to have increased cardiac risk. If you have a high carnitine level but a low TMAO level, that is, let's say your microbiota composition was healthier, you, didn't, you weren't a TMAO producer, you're at low risk, even though you had the high carnitine level. Presumably, these were high uh, carnitine ingesting subjects. We don't, we don't know the dietary patterns of these individuals, unfortunately. This was a study of over 2,500 subjects. So to summarize, I'd like to suggest that in addition to foods high in cholesterol and saturated fat, there are other dietary nutrients that through their, the action of gut microbes, um, that is like choline and carnitine, can generate small molecule metabolites that are biologically active, acting at a distant site and influencing cholesterol and sterile metabolism in the artery wall, such as in the macrophage, in the, in the liver, such as in the synthesis of bile acids, and in the enterocyte in terms of cholesterol absorption and cholesterol and bile acid metabolism. And collectively, it's serving like a rheostat on the light switch. You need cholesterol to have atherosclerosis, just like you need electricity to have a light bulb turn on, but you can have a rheostat, and if you have a high TMA level, the, the dimmer switch is bright, and uh, at any given cholesterol level, you have a more, bigger chance of getting atherosclerosis. If the dimmer switch is down, you have a low TMA level, you have less chance of getting atherosclerosis. Now I'm going to end just by saying, where else do we get carnitine? Well, in addition to these foods, it is a very common recent dietary supplement, um, and uh, not only in things that are shown here, but also, um, you know, some of these energy drinks have an extraordinary amount of carnitine within them. If you'll notice that it's it, the carnitine content in Monster in particular is in front of the glucose. So it's the most abundant additive that they have. And it's one uh, portion of a steak is approximately 160 to 180 milligrams. So we're talking a lot of carnitine in, in the can. So. We were interested in asking, this is the last piece of data, this is unpublished, if you're on a chronic vegan diet, are you protected if you start taking carnitine supplements? Because actually many vegetarian and vegans, to try to augment their carnitine, will be on a daily carnitine supplement, thinking that they're missing it because they're on a vegetarian or vegan diet. And what's shown on the left are the carnitine challenges that were done at baseline or after one month or two months of daily carnitine supplementation. And uh, the vegans are, that we've done so far are shown on the left, the omnivores uh, on the top and the omnivores on the bottom. And what can be seen, and then on the right-hand side, is just fasting plasma levels. And that tells the story. If you have um, chronic carnitine supplementation, regardless of your diet, you know, we are walking tissue culture dishes, and if you give a nutrient that the microbes like, those that have the selective, they get a selective advantage, and now they're going to be more populous and grow. And so um, actually chronic diet carnitine exposure is changing the intestinal microbial composition and making the subjects more prone to making TMAO, which we think is a proatherogenic phenotype. So it suggests or makes us wonder if chronic carnitine exposure and things even like energy drinks might be a long-term adverse thing that certainly needs further studies in the future. I'll just end by uh, thanking you for your attention and point out four main individuals in particular. The four major papers that I've discussed uh, were each co uh, first authors uh, by uh, individuals in my group, Zanang Wang, Bob Koth, and Wilson Tang. Uh, Brian Bennett, working with you at UCLA with Jake Lucis, was the author of the Cell Metab paper. And I also want to point out our colleagues at UPenn, Rick Bushman, 
uh, Dr. Chen and Gary Wu as well. Thank you very much. Okay, maybe one question while we're uh, transitioning between speakers here. We're running a little bit behind. Well, here's one. The, um, over here. The, um, since a number of, uh, of lipids can be a source of, the, of trimethylamine uh, the, with the choline uh, head group, why is it that carnitine sticks out as being a substrate? Or is that the conclusion that you have? Or is that not the case? In other words, is it that, that uh, making the trimethylamine is one thing, but then there's some other ecology or indirect process related to L-carnitine, which goes with the cardiovascular risk? Well, um, we th I think that any of the trimethylamine nutrients, whether it's carnitine or phosphatidylcholine or choline, possibly betaine, um, acetylcarnitine, all of these can be converted into uh, TMA and TMAO. And so far, in an animal model level, all of them are associating with accelerated atherosclerosis. So I don't think there's anything unique about carnitine. I think we studied carnitine after our first study on choline. So uh, carnitine just has that trimethylamine group and is yet a, the gut flora can actually cleave it off and it has the same conserved group. That's why we started looking at the carnitine as a, so th but the two most abundant trimethylamines in a Western diet are going to be carnitine and phosphatidylcholine, lecithin. Do you have a quick question? Yeah. Excellent yeah. talk. You, you mentioned that carnitine uh, can be bad if uh, TMO levels are high. But carnitine has a lot of benefit in certain diseases of interest. Uh, there are diseases with low carnitine, autism, the work we're doing in, uh, working in. Are there um, efforts to look at TMO levels in other disorders where carnitine metabolism is involved? And you've made an excellent point, which what, for uh, supplements, what might be good for some disorder may be very bad for another. We haven't looked at autism. We actually. Um, after our paper came out, I got a landslide of, of emails asking about acetylcarnitine because there, apparently it's a common nutrient or supplement that's used with uh, reported benefits for cognition and um, in various neurodegenerative disorders or dementia. Um, we have been studying it. All I can say is that we're looking at it from the cardiovascular standpoint, not the dementia standpoint. and. Um, uh, I can say that you get accelerated or you get enhanced TMA and TMAO development by ingestion of acetylcarnitine. Whether that leads to accelerated atherosclerosis in an animal model, we don't know the answer yet. But it's a good example that, you know, for some disorders it shows promise in specific studies as opposed to being a carte blanche thing that everyone eats. It's an excellent study. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we need to move on. Okay, the uh, next speaker is uh, Christian Chaban uh, from the University of Florida School of Medicine, and he's going to be talking about um, the gut microbiome and colorectal cancer. Ouch. 